Good morning. morning. Welcome to Luther Memorial Church and School. Remember the Church of Luther Confession, the CLC. Today we continue in our series, Chapters to Remember in the Bible, and today we focus on Genesis chapter 3. Today we see in our, also our Mission Festival Sunday, how this chapter is so important for how we share that good news about our Savior. We begin this morning's service with prayer. O Lord God, we come together to hear your holy word, that through the hearing of your word we may be brought to repent of our sins, to believe on Jesus in life and in death, and to grow day by day in your grace and holiness. Hear us now, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. We follow the order of service today as printed in your bulletin or on the projection screen. And we begin our Mission Festival worship service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We open with the singing of hymn 770 out of the Tan Supplement. Please rise. We use the order of matins as printed in the bulletin as an, on the projector is also. 
O Lord, open my lips. And my mouth shall show forth thy praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Please be seated for our first scripture lesson. Today's chapter to remember is Genesis chapter 3. In this chapter we see not only the Lord God and Adam and Eve, but Satan is now mentioned. Since we are told that all things were created in the six days of creation, we know all the angels were created during that time also, possibly along with the other celestial beings on day 4. The rebellion of the devil and evil angels had to have happened after the seventh day, since God called everything good. So this chapter probably took place very shortly after the creation week, since Adam and Eve had not yet conceived children. Notice Satan's clever tactic of raising doubt and pride in their minds. Notice God's punishment, but also great mercy in promising the whole world a savior from this sin and all others. Reading chapter 3 from Genesis. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die. The serpent said to the woman, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I command you to not eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Curse it as the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve, because she would become the mother of all the living. 
The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And he must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. One thought that might enter your mind is, why was it a loving thing that God drove them out of the garden? Now in sin, would it be a good thing for Adam and Eve to live in this sinful world forever, eating from that tree of life? And so you can see again God's mercy of having another plan for Adam and Eve. The promise of a Savior. Our second scripture lesson will be singing Psalm 118 selected verses as you see printed in your bulletin or on the projection screen. Screen. I will praise you that this is the day the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Notice that's the second time now that we have sang glory be to the Father and to the Son as it was in the beginning will be now and forever. Amen. That's obviously not talking about the Garden of Eden. That's talking about our God who never changes. 
Can you imagine Adam and Eve now being drove out of the garden? Would they be able to sing what we just sang? This is the day the Lord has made. We'll rejoice and be glad, having just been kicked out of the garden. How could they rejoice? It's because they knew of the promise of God and what he had said that he would send to them in spite of their sin. And so we see the understanding of that promise from Romans 5, verses 12 through 19, our third scripture lesson. Paul's letter to the Romans explains God's promise of a Savior to the world. Adam's sin brought death to the world. Christ's perfect and innocent death brought life to the world. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all sinned. For before the law was given, sin was in the world. But sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. Even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Again, the gift of God is not like the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. What good news for us today, news in which we also make confession of our faith. We do so this morning by using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us therefore rise boldly to confess this faith in our Lord and Savior. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord asks us to have a childlike faith that trusts Him in all things. We hear the Lord give that faith to the children also as we give them opportunity to sing This is the Day the Lord Has Made. Did you see it?
You guys can go ahead and sit down there for the children's sermon. Thank you very much for singing that, that hymn there. Uh, I have a box of cereal here. When I was growing up in my house, this one doesn't have one, but I always looked forward to when the box of cereal had a prize inside. I was really excited to find out what that prize was. Any of you ever gotten a prize out of a cereal box before? Yeah? You might be disappointed because on the box it looks like such a neat prize. But when you get on the inside, it's like, oh, that's kind of cheaply made, not as nice, and it smells like cereal, too. You know, the devil in the garden tempted Adam and Eve. He tempted them by saying, if you eat from that tree, if you eat from that fruit that God commanded you not to, you're going to get a prize. You're going to be like God. The devil was lying to them. In fact, what they found out was what they, the prize was death for disobeying God. When we look at God's word, there's a different truth to the matter. When we look at God's word, inside God's word, we have a prize. We have salvation from our sin. We have hope in Jesus. What a wonderful thing that God's word again today teaches us, although the devil says, hey, you can do things that are going to feel good, you can do things that are going to make you happy, it doesn't matter what God says, go for that prize. God says, no, follow my word and look forward to the prize of eternal life because you have faith in me as your Savior. We can pray that the Lord reminds us of this prize every day and know that the prize that Jesus gives us is our hope of eternal life. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, bless our day today. Help us remember that you have made today and it is something that we can rejoice and be glad in because of your forgiveness of all of our sins. Bless us as we look for that eternal prize through your word of truth, having faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear Pilgrim Partners, every word of God is pure, and all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Es espanol. Pandre en amistad entre tu y la mire, y entre tu simiente y la de ella. Su simiente te al pastar a la cabaza, pero tu le moderas el telón. Un Deutsch. Und ich will verstaft setzen, wir sind der und dem Vive. Und setzen die dem Samen und ihrem Samen, der selbst der Sohn, der den Kopf zerzerzen. Und du wirst ihr in die Füße stecken. Or in Hebrew. It's a little bit harder. Ve Abba, Asha, ve Naik, u ve in. An ar uben the are ak uben var ah hu yisha ur pa rosh ve atath ve tuso ru pe unu vachar or in English and I will put enmity between you and the woman between your seed and her seed he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Many of you maybe understood the Spanish. Some of you maybe understood the German. I'm guessing most of you probably didn't understand the Hebrew. I'm guessing all of you understood the English. However, just because it was in English does not mean we understood what it meant. All four languages, I did my best in reading them, but all four versions were all 
Genesis 3.15. When you look at these versions, when you look at this one passage, you might be thinking, how on earth is this verse a mission festival passage? One that we would talk about today. The key is, if we're going to understand verse 15, we need to, and we will, understand where Christ's mission began. And so we read the context of Genesis 3, verses 14 and 15 also. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is the word of God, so we pray. Lord God, creator of all the universe, create in us a clean heart and open our ears to the hearing of your word of truth. Teach us from your example what true love really is, and give us a heart like yours that has a mission-minded mouth to speak the good news, gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends, what's the first thing you think about when you see a rainbow? 25 years ago when I was my son Titus's age, the first thing I thought about was Sunday school. The lesson on the flood. The rainbow that God had promised in which he would never send a flood again like that on the earth. 25 years later, today when I see a rainbow, whether it be in the sky or on a bumper sticker or on someone's house, I immediately think first of gay pride. Do you see in just a short amount of time the need for the word, the need for the truth for this generation? We actually have to retrain our brain to think first of God's word, first of God's promises and his covenants. Think when you see a rainbow of Genesis 9, 16, which says, whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. God's reminder of an ever lasting covenant. What's the word covenant mean? Promise. When we think about God's promises, we will see his reminders as with the rainbow. When we think of God's covenants, we can actually see the reminder in the verses today. If you look at verse 14, now we know that the devil, we know that Satan used the form of a serpent in tempting Adam and Eve. But notice the covenant reminder that God did in the punishments of that serpent. He said in verse 14, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle, more than every beast of the field. You shall belly shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. It's hard to understand alone, verse 15. If we don't understand first who God is talking to, to the serpent here, to the devil. The serpent, like the rainbow, like God's covenant, is a reminder of wickedness. When we see the rainbow, we can think of God's promise, but why did God have to make that promise? Why did God send the flood in the first place? We're told in Genesis that the evil of a man's heart was only evil in those days, except for Noah and his family. When we see a rainbow, we can see God's wrath literally poured out on the world to cleanse it from its sin. When we see a rainbow, we can also see God's loving promise that he will never again flood the world and destroy it like he did in that way. When we see the serpent, we can think of God's punishment for the wickedness of Adam and Eve in disobedience to God's command to not eat from that tree. When we see a serpent slithering on the ground, we see its craftiness, its stealthiness. And is it a wonder that so many people are afraid of snakes? A serpent is a reminder of our enemy, the devil. 
As we see in verse 14, a sly and cunning enemy. We see the serpent as a lowly creature. One that is fearful, one that is deadly with this fiery venom. Doesn't that describe the devil? Sharing God's truth, but in a half-truth. His fiery venom is what ultimately he wants to inflict upon us to get us to fall away from our faith completely and end up in the fires of hell with him. The serpent is a fearful reminder of God's wrath and the way the devil works in our lives to rob us of our treasure, to rob us of what Jesus has done for us. Verse 15 says what God his covenant would be for Adam and Eve. His promise. He said to the serpent, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. What does that word enmity mean? I teach the catechism students that the easiest way to remember enmity is just think of what it sounds like. Enemy. Recognize the enmity that God put between Eve and the serpent and the devil. Between Eve and Adam and the devil. Remember when the devil came to Eve and Adam? What was the thought? Well, he's saying some pretty good things here. He's reminding us of what God's covenant is, of his promise. He's reminding us of God's command in the garden not to eat from the tree. Even Adam looked at the devil at first as a friend and as an ally. We see from God's truth that that enmity, that enemy, that hatred, hostility between the two would now be separate. Adam and Eve knew better of what it was to mix with the devil and his thoughts and his temptations. And we can see the truth also today. As we see the hostility and hatred, hatred towards God, we are not innocent either. Romans 8, 7 says, because the carnal mind, that sinful, the mortal mind, is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. You know what that verse is saying? It says, we by our nature are God's enemies. When the Bible talks about here, when God's promise of putting enmity between the woman and the devil, or mankind and the devil, it's a reminder also of what God has done for us. This hostility. It's not just between the two. Because as we look at our apologetics lesson for today, our defense of God's word, our answer for the reason, we, the hope we have in us, what does the world say? The world says, I love you because. In other words, if they were saying about their love for God, they would say, God, I love you because you give me all these nice riches in this world. I expect those things. Or I love you because, God, that, you know, it's in my best interest to follow you because really there's nothing else to follow in this world. The world says that when we use the word love, maybe of one another, we should say, I love you because you do nice things for me. Or I love you because I get something in return for it. When we look at the word of God, God says, as we see in the Garden of Eden here, I love you in spite of. I love you in spite of your sin, he said to Adam and Eve. They had disobeyed him. They deserved punishment. They deserved eternal death, just like the devil and the angels would receive. But he says, I love you in spite of the fact that you disobeyed me. He says the same thing to you and me. When we disobey God, God does not act like the world and says, I love you because you serve me to that level of perfection that I demand, we say, no, we've fallen short. Just as the word says. God says, I love you in spite of your wickedness. I love you in spite of your sin. And I love you so much, I'll sacrifice my perfect son for you. That enemy, that enmity between Satan and the Eve, we see between the world and what it says, and what Christians ought to say about God and about love. We see an enmity truly here, as God was saying to the devil, between Satan and that promised seed, that promised descendant of Adam and Eve, 
Jesus Christ. The enmity between the devil and the world, our own sinful flesh, and our Savior, God's promise in the garden of Jesus Christ. The serpent is a reminder of Christ's victory. When we look at the Word of God, we see in Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates His own love. This in spite of type of love, this agape love, a sacrificial love, but it goes on to say that He demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, while we didn't deserve it, while we were God's enemies, Christ died for us. How is the serpent a reminder of these covenants? A covenant of God's wrath, a covenant of God's mercy. My second year in Vickering, I was Vickering with Pastor Paul Tiefel. I remember whenever he would talk about Genesis 3.15, he would explain it in such a way. When God promised that he would send a descendant from Adam and Eve to crush the head of the devil, we can picture it, as a person stomping on the head of a snake. In doing so, the heel would be bruised, but that head of that serpent would be defeated and destroyed. That, my friends, is what we see in the Word of God. The first gospel promise, immediately after the fall and the sin, immediate mercy, immediate love in spite of sin, a promise that God would send His Son, would send a son from the woman and man that would crush the head of the devil, that would give us the victory forever. That day was on Good Friday. When Jesus died on the cross, he defeated, he crushed the head of the devil once and for all. And in that death of our Savior, we know it was a bruise that would heal because three days later he would rise again. This is the first gospel promise for us. A covenant, a reminder for us that the victory has been complete, that our sins are forgiven, that when Jesus said it is finished on the cross, he meant it. Good news for us who are sinners. When we look at this victorious death of our Lord, we can think of, as is also said in 1 John 4, This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Whether it be a serpent that reminds us of Christ's victory, of his punishment of the devil and of Adam and Eve at that fall in the sin in the Garden of Eden, whether it be the rainbow showing again of God's wrath and God's mercy, these signs help us remember the truths, the covenants, God our Father's promises to each one of you. In order that, so that we can show the same love to the world in spite of of how the world treats us. We talked about the different languages. This first gospel promise has gone out to the world, has been translated in every language to show that God keeps His promises. We have opportunities to support with our prayers or offerings or physically going there to the overseas countries who speak the languages that we've talked about today. The Lord continue to give us this endeavor And we can see, in answering that question, how in the world is this a mission text? Because we see this is where Christ's mission began, with God's promise. We are here to share His mission and where His mission ended on the cross for our sins. Our mission, as we have in the sign, as is our motto, we preach Christ crucified. Victory over the devil. Victory over our sin. Victory over our graves. The first gospel promise gives us victory in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have the blessed opportunity to be mission-minded like God, who has given us this mission to share 
the good news of Christ's victory to all the world. Amen. Please rise. May this peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and your minds in our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Continue with our sermon hymn, 245 of the Red Hymnal. Please be seated.
We give thee but thine own, whate'er the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. May we thy bounties thus as stewards to receive, and gladly as thou blessed us, to thee our first fruits give. Amen. Last Sunday we prayed for Pastor Ed Starkey's installation and commissioning to go overseas as our second foreign missionary. Uh, we also keep him in our prayers, he and his wife Janice, for the upcoming weeks as they make their travel around the world to India, where they'll be living now as our second foreign missionary for the CLC. Along with these prayers, we also pray for Thanksgiving, for 51 years of grace for Wayne and Darlene Wisniewski, as their anniversary is today. With these prayers and our general mission prayer, let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, who has paid the price of our sins and reconciled us to God, make us fully committed to you and to your gospel so that we feel an urgent need to share you with others. Help us to seek and save the lost among our families, our neighbors, and our friends, and even our enemies. And bless the word we speak, using it to work faith in their hearts. Cause the word of salvation thus sown and rooted in the hearts of redeemed sinners to bring forth abundantly the fruit of works that would give you glory and not ourselves. Defeat every godless force which would lay stumbling blocks in the way of the gospel, whether it be idols or whether it be profane words or whether it be the twisting of your words just as the devil did in the garden. Give our pastors, teachers, and missionaries a deep sense of dedication to their calling that selfish pride and self-glory may have no part in their ministries. Fill each of us with enthusiasm for their work. May we ever support them with our prayers and willingly provide for their physical needs. Protect our missionaries wherever they labor, keeping them from their families from all harm and danger. According to your gracious will, give them good health and spare them the ravages of sickness and disease. Bear them up when they have no strength and encourage them when the way is difficult. Hinder every evil power which would threaten to drive our missionaries from foreign lands. Open up those countries to the gospel which hitherto have been closed to it. Grant that your word, wherever it is preached, will not return unto you void, but accomplish your purpose of bringing sinners to repentance. Hear our prayers on behalf of Ed and Janice Starkey. Give them safe travels to those distant and foreign lands. Help them always to speak your word truthfully and faithfully, 
so that it would go out and spread quickly like waters in a barren land. O crucified and risen Christ, give grace to your church day by day, that it may accomplish the task to which you have called it, to witness your name in all the world, and to preach the gospel to every creature. We also pray for Wayne and Darlene, as you have given them wonderful blessings over the past 51 years when you brought them together in husband and wife. We ask that you would continue to bless them in years to come, until you call them from their earthly mission to be with you forever in heaven. We too must flee for refuge to your name, asking pardon for all our many sins. Pardon especially our neglect of your great commission, for we all too often fail to glorify your saving name to others. Forgive us and save us, precious Redeemer of mankind. Amen. We also join in the Lord's Prayer. Please rise. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. You may be seated for the singing of our last hymn, hymn 780 out of the Tan Supplement.
Very warm welcome to all of you here today. Glad you could come and hear the covenants of our Lord God and the promises He continues to make to us in this valley of death that we live in. We can definitely rejoice and be glad that this is the day the Lord has made. Uh, a couple announcements to call your attention to in the bulletin. Uh, I will be out of town this week for pastoral conference up in Marquette, Michigan. I will be back in time for next Sunday. Um, flu shots are available next Sunday, uh, before and after the service. Speak with Diane Capazzo if you have any questions on that at all. Uh, there is a ladies' meeting this Tuesday at 6.30. And this Friday we're having a, a, a game night at Steve and Jody's at 6.30. So uh, if you'd like to come or if you need more information on that, uh, please speak to them. It's a, a sequence tournament. Should be a lot of fun. So all are welcome to come to that. Um, because we're uh, all in invited in the basement, I hope you can stay for lunch for our Potluck Mission Festival lunch. Um, please head down there right away and we'll start with our uh, table prayer so we can just get right in line and start eating whenever the ladies have things ready to go. So we'll have our table prayer now. Just as in the garden, Lord, the eyes of all look upon you to satisfy the desire of every living thing. You open your hand and give them their meat in due season. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts to us be blessed. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Amen. Am I forgetting any announcements for this morning? What? Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, Miss Naomi Bernthal for all of her teaching and help she provide the first six weeks of school. Uh, so maybe we can just get, thank her by a round of applause. Uh, the kids have already expressed how much they're going to miss her. Because she didn't work at all this last six, well, didn't work at her job the last six weeks. <laughs> uh, if you'd like to help support her in her absence from work, the Mile Church, today will be the last day to help with that. So any, any loose offerings or things you'd like to give her could be put in the Mile Church. Any other announcements? Lord bless you all in the reading and hearing of his wonderful word of promise. The Lord is with you.